Welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. This is the show that brings leading minds from the energy industry to discuss the challenges and trends that are transforming and modernizing our energy system. And a quick thank you to West Monroe, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. I'm Jason Price, Energy Central podcast host and director with West Monroe, coming to you from New York City. And with me, as always, from Orlando, Florida, is Energy Central producer and community manager, Matt Chester. Matt, we're diving into the world of innovation around material science as it relates to the creation and manufacturing of solar panels and what this may mean for the solar industry in reaching climate goals. The topic we'll be discussing has economic, global, political, and local implications. To play it safe, we pulled in an academician in material science and is at the forefront leading in the next generation of solar panel development. Before we welcome him though, can you set the stage for what we've covered in solar on the podcast and what the hot topics in this field are on Energy Central? Sure thing, Jason, and, and you're right. Solar energy, it's a topic that's come up more than once in our catalog of episodes. Looking back, we've chatted with the executive vice president at Summit Ridge Energy on community solar as a program. That was episode 114. We heard about a pilot for floating solar from Turlock Irrigation District in episode 90. And the director of the Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technology Office joined us all the way back in episode 43 to highlight the work that the department is doing to build the solar grid of tomorrow. But I'd say we, we focused on the podcast mostly on installations, tariffs, policies, programs, things like that, and not as much on the science behind those latest technologies. So I think we're definitely getting into some important new territory for us today. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. It's a good summary. Uh, this is definitely a critical topic as the International Energy Agency recently published a report that 2023 global solar investment is projected to overtake oil for the first time. For every $1 in oil, there will be $1.70 in solar. So this bodes well for future U.S. manufacturing of this equipment, as we will hear from our next guest. So with us to discuss further is Juan Pablo Correa Bena, Assistant Professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology, or Georgia Tech. Juan Pablo, welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we get into the meat of the matter, Juan Pablo, I'd love if you could give our listeners a bit more of your background. What are your areas of focus at Georgia Tech, and what role does the school play in this broader solar technology discussion? Sure thing. So I am an assistant professor here at Georgia Tech, and I specialize in material science. My research group is trying to develop the next generation of materials that are going to be coming online on your solar panels in the near future. And so what we're trying to do is from the fundamental material science, trying to develop these new materials using physics and chemistry to try to bring improved properties, improved durability into the materials. So a little bit more about what we exactly do is we try to come up with new compositions, new chemistries that that we can mix together into a material and make a film, for example. And that film will then absorb light, and that light uh, will be converted into electrons with energy that we can store in those electrons and uh, extract it via cables, right? So that's the basics of, of a solar cell. What we're particularly interested in, in my group at Georgia Tech, is how this material, this layer, this film that we're growing on a piece of glass, for example, how we can control the structure. And when I'm talking about structure, I'm talking about atoms, the arrangement of atoms. When we modify the arrangement of atoms, we modify the crystal structure of these materials, and that in turn, uh, in turn has an effect in the properties of the material. So what we're trying to do basically is study structure, uh, crystallographic structure and property relationships to try to make these materials more efficient and last longer. Uh, so that's, that's the basics of, of what we're doing. And we, we have a very, very heavy focus on, on photovoltaics devices, basically, 
that we make in our labs and we have this small scale samples that we can put together in our labs to test new compositions and new chemistries, for example. That's kind of what we do in my group. I uh, have a, a group of about eight to 10 PhD students at a time who are studying different aspects of these materials to try to make them more efficient and last longer. And more broadly, at Georgia Tech, we are trying to tackle the solar challenges from different angles. So people like me who are studying materials are going to be more at the fundamental level, trying to understand how to improve materials properties via modifications of the crystallographic structure. But then there's going to be other people who are going to be more interested in, for example, the manufacturing processes and how, how do we improve the efficiency of actually making and manufacturing a solar panel. And so that's, there's going to be a lot of mechanical engineers and industrial engineers who are going to be focusing a lot more on the logistics. There's a lot of, a lot of new territory that we're trying to cover right now that includes artificial intelligence, for example, helping us spot a, a, a faulty solar cell, for example, and, and using cameras and, and artificial intelligence to try to spot, uh, help us spot those faulty devices. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Georgia Tech at large is having a wide impact in the solar transition and solar technologies because we are such an interdisciplinary and large engineering school where we have people like me who, is more, who are working more fundamental science and then some other people who are working more on the manufacturing side. Yeah, understood. I mean, certainly material science is um, critical is to help drive the overall energy transformation. So it's, it's important. Absolutely. So let's dig in a little bit further with the recent announcement that the theme of the Buy America slogan is important and that we're seeing um, the technology overtake uh, oil. Uh, but how did we get to where we are? Uh, today. So can you give us a bit of a history lesson about what led to the point where the U.S. is really playing catch up now with solar development? Absolutely. Let's start in 1839 <laughs> when the photovoltaic effect was discovered by Emil Becquerel. That's, that's the first time that we see that we can convert sunlight into voltage and current. So, you know, that's the first time that we hear about this. And later on in 1954, um, Einstein got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, where he basically was able to show that a photon of light can basically remove an electron from a metal. And then later on in the, in the 70s and 80s, we started investing into this idea of having a photon coming into a material, interacting with that material, and producing electricity with it by basically giving energy, that energy from the photon into an electron, into a a ground state electron that then goes up in energy. And so about 100 years passed until we actually started using this and tried to really understand how to make solar cells that were efficient enough for them to be economical. The 70s and the, in the 80s had a lot of, it was, it, was a, it was a big time for photovoltaics, but we were still in a very, very niche environment, right? So we were looking at solar panels that would be useful for space application, so, you know, we didn't care about the costs about, of, of these panels. We, we were using them to, to power satellites and to use power in space. So for that, we were flush with cash and we just don't really care about how much we were spending on them. Of course, in the 70s, there was a, the oil crisis where, you know, oil prices were really high and we started thinking, okay, maybe we're, we're approaching peak oil. And that also brought a lot of incentive for the community to start looking into other sources that didn't include oil. So that's when we started looking at photovoltaics as a, as a viable way for producing electricity. Fast forward to 2000, and we still haven't gotten there, right? So 30 years later, about 30 years later, even until 2010, we didn't really make solar panels that made economic sense. We were making solar, solar panels that were relatively low in efficiency, relatively expensive to manufacture, and definitely much more expensive than burning oil to produce electricity or burning coal, uh, coal for example, to, to produce electricity. And so what really happened here is an example of economies of scale where Asian governments, specifically China, came in and provided a lot, a lot of incentives for companies to come and set up a factory in Chinese territory 
to basically make that process uh, much more cheaply, make that process much more low cost. And it was basically economies of scale, basically coming in and making uh, large uh, systems that would be able to handle a lot of wafers and automation for uh, making the process much more efficient and, and low cost. So that happened in 2000, let's say 2010, 2011, and that really had a huge impact in the price of a solar panel and the electricity that we, that we get from a, from a solar panel. One, because the efficiencies at the module scale were increased to almost 20%. I mean, now I think we're beyond 20% for, for a module. And then that's, that's one. And then two, because of this, this idea of, of, of economies of scale, where we're, we're able to scale up processes and therefore reduce costs. Right. No, that's a very helpful uh, historical review and, and certainly forward looking at, you know, I guess you could say some of American ingenuity in, in terms of solving the problem, but it was, I'm sure there was contributions around the globe. Certainly, when you mentioned the Asian market, they have really capitalized on the scalability of, you know, manufacturing. So that's a key component to the success story. Where you sit, tell us, if you can, what is the industry doing to develop and bring the manufacturing capacity back to the U.S.? And what are you seeing in labs around manufacturing? So there's a material science component to it, but, you know, there's a manufacturing component to it. Can you speak about the manufacturing side of all this? Sure. So let me very briefly talk about the material science first, and then I'll go into the manufacturing, if that's okay. From the material science perspective, we are trying to develop new materials. That's something that I already discussed at the top of the show, where we're trying to develop new materials that will be, let's say, the next generation of solar panels. And what is very critical here is to understand that the materials that we're trying to develop right now are going to be important. And the material that we're trying to develop now are going to bring the cost down in the manufacturing, but also in the amount of money that we're going to be spending in terms of setting up a factory. So what we call capital expenditures. So this is where innovation comes in and where the U.S. can lead the way, where we can basically come in and say, okay, we have a lot of resources in the U.S. to study these fundamental problems. Can we come up with a material that then will basically overtake the solar technology realm? So that's, that's from the materials point of view, right? So that's, that's something that I'm actively working on. And then from the manufacturing point of view, there's a couple of things. I mentioned briefly artificial intelligence, for example. That's something that has kind of exploded in the past few years, where now we have machine learning algorithms that are helping us understand data that, you know, even five years ago, we didn't know how to deal with. I'll give you an example. Here in my own labs, I'm making solar cells, and I'm making these solar cells, and I'm trying to test them. And so when I'm testing them, I'm able to produce a lot of data points. But sometimes what happens is that we have so much data, that it's very difficult for my students, my PhD students, to go in and understand what the data is telling me. And so what we're doing is using machine learning algorithms that help us parse through the data and try to understand what this data is actually telling us. And so this is something that, that is new and that you know, the U.S. has done an, a tremendous job in terms of trying to implement in, in manufacturing, not only manufacturing, but pretty much everywhere. We're using it university level. And so, you know, industry is also trying to, to do the same. And this actually helps a lot with speeding up processes because once you have an algorithm that goes in, checks pictures of your solar panels, for example, or images, photoluminescence images, for example, which is used as a proxy for how good a solar panel is, the human eye might not be able to catch some defects that are going to be consequential to the long-term durability of the, of the solar panel, but an algorithm will be. And so we can train these algorithms to look for some of these defects and be able to catch some of these defects that, that will be detrimental to the solar panel in the long term. So I think that there's a lot of innovation in the manufacturing sector that is now related to more of the so automation and that sort of thing. That's something that we already kind of perfected so that we can have very high throughput. But now the next generation 
of these plants or these manufacturing facilities are going to have to implement artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. Okay. So if I may repeat back some of what I heard here is that the way we manufacture solar panels today is going to be far different in terms of how we're going to be doing in the future because the material will be different and the technology around AI and the analysis and the quality controls and such will be different so that we will basically dominate or, or potentially be further ahead than our competition, China and others, in the future manufacturing of the next generation of solar panels. Is that basically what you're saying? Yep, exactly. So, so yeah, I think this is, this is a two-way approach. And one is short-term, which is happening right now, and the other one is a little bit more long-term. The short-term is, yeah, how can we make the analysis of the manufacturing line more efficient? How can we speed that up? That's where artificial intelligence can help us. The long term is going to be more, what is the next generation of materials that we're going to be developing to have materials that can be produced at lower costs, at lower temperatures? Temperature here is key because silicon ingots are made at over 1000 degrees Celsius. And that puts very big constraint in, in the manufacturing process. That's something that you really cannot avoid in silicon. So can we come up with new sets of materials that will require, let's say, 100 or 200 degrees Celsius, which is something that we can do with a simple oven versus like a very complicated oven that has actually a, a high, itself has a, a high carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. So solar technology has become, you know, so much more efficient and so much cheaper in the past few decades. How much room for improvement is really left? What, what are some of the new breakthroughs your teams are looking at to maturity that can you know, unlock the next level of the next generation? I guess you could say, does Moore's law apply with solar panels? It's a really good question. I think that we are really approaching the lowest costs in solar. The good news is that we're at or below the cost of producing electricity from, for example, coal or natural gas. So that's what we call, I mean, and you, you probably know this, this is what we call price parity, where we try to kind of match the costs of electricity produced from solar to that of the traditional sources. And so we, we basically are below price parity or right up above price parity, where, where solar can now compete with established sources of, of electricity. So that's one thing. But there's something else that is even more important as we go forward, and it has to do with cost. And I mentioned it a little bit just before that we are interested in lowering the temperatures at, we're, at which we're producing these materials. And that's going to have an impact in manufacturing. Why? Because we have these materials that are produced at 1,000 degrees, so those are going to be the sil silicon-based materials that require this very high investment in equipment. So let's say if you want to set up a manufacturing plant for silicon wafers, that's going to cost you a couple of billion dollars. And that's mainly because you have very complicated processes that are involved in manufacturing that ingots of silicon that require very low levels of contamination. So, you know, you have to use clean rooms, for example. Then you also have the temperature constraint where you have to use these furnaces to remove impurities and melt the silicon dioxide to make it into a silicon wafer and into a silicon ingot. So there's a bunch of different things that come with current approach that are very expensive up front. And that has an impact on who and how these manufacturing facilities come online and who, who is able to invest in that, right? So it, it comes to how much money do we have available to set up a factory like that. Now, the Inflation Reduction Act has provided a lot of tax incentives and loans to help make this transition, but we would like to make it even easier for next generations of manufacturers to come in and say, hey, maybe I'm going to set up a smaller plant in a couple of places throughout the U.S. that are not two or three billion dollars to set up, but maybe 300 or 400 million dollars. So I think that that's where we can make the biggest impact is how fast do we transition and how fast can we set up manufacturing plants across the world, not just the U.S., but across the world 
so that we can go into a future where we have maximum capacity of manufacturing of, of solar panels. So I think that just to kind of wrap up that question, I think how I see this is that we have reached price parity and, you know, going below that is probably, we can do it and, and, and you know, with incentives and, and some of the manufacturing advantages that we're going to have regarding AI, for example, we can continue to drop that price a little bit, but we're really saturating right now. That cost is, is not going to go down that, that much lower than it is currently. Where we can have an impact is in how much it costs for us to set up a manufacturing facility and that that will require a more long-term vision that we're trying to to have here in, in my group at Georgia Tech. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, well, Pablo, you covered a, a, a wide spectrum of categories from, you know, the, the political environment, I guess you could say, the regulatory, the scientific, the cost, R&D, the materials, I mean, so the process from, from, from one end of the spectrum to the next. But if you can influence that policy side to be as beneficial as possible for further development in this space, what would you recommend? Sort of what would you look at and how would you influence that? Where would you want to influence that? So if you would have talked to me a year ago, I would have said, let's pass a bill in Congress that allows for manufacturers to come and get interest-free or very cheap loans so that they can set up manufacturing plants. Fortunately, that happened and, you know, it was not at the scale that I think we needed, but it's pretty good. And that's the Inflation Reduction Act. And so that's, that's been very monumental for the solar landscape in the country because now we have companies like Q-Cells here in, in Georgia coming in and saying, hey, there's this tax breaks. And if we bring the whole manufacturing plant that, you know, manufactures the ingots all the way to the panel, here in Georgia, these are the the types of incentives that we can have from the state and from the federal government. And so that's been great. It's created a a big push for for companies to come in and invest and set up manufacturing facilities here. I'd say that we still need a little bit more, right? We need to continue pushing that and making sure that, you know, it's not just Georgia, but other states that are continuing to do that. And, you know, hopefully we'll see that as, as the IRA continues to be deployed. I think where where we could have a big impact and is relatively inexpensive is in the permitting side. So right now, if you want to set up a solar farm, you have to ask for permits basically to plug into the grid. There's a lot of red tape. And I think that that's something that Congress was trying to pass right around the same time as, as the Inflation Reduction Act was being passed. But it was not able to pass the full bill as it's needed. And so we still have a barrier to deployment of solar farms because of permitting issues. So I think that that's something where uh, Congress should be acting and making it easier. Also, at the Department of Energy level, I know that they're working very diligently to try to make sure that that process is sped up. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, but it's for sure something that we need to put more effort into. Yeah, no doubt. Well, this has been really informative. It's always great to have uh, the academic point of view, especially you know someone like yourself who's innovating in the you know really in the thick of it and um, helping lead the way. So this is this has been really enlightening. I appreciate it. You know, so Juan Pablo, now we've reached the point of what we call the lightning round, which is an opportunity to learn a bit, a little bit more of you, the person, rather than you, the scientist. So I'm going to ask you five questions. And you, we leave you to respond back either with one word or phrase. So, are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Favorite snack food? Pickles, believe it or not. Do you have any hidden talents? Uh, I am a good dancer. What is your ideal vacation? I enjoy backpacking in countries where I don't speak the language. Who do you look up to? John Goodenough, uh, he actually just passed away yesterday or two days ago. He was the Nobel laureate for 2019 in chemistry for inventing the lithium ion battery. What are you most motivated by? Discovery in science. Uh, it's what motivates me. That's why I'm doing this job, trying to create new things and new technologies and also good food. <laughs> you did a great job there and a great job. Overall, so we're going to give you the last word. So what would you like and hope our listeners take away from this episode? Yeah, so I think that we're at a 
turning points in, in the country in terms of what solar is going to be for the energy landscape. And that's something that a year ago I was not sure was going to happen uh, so quick, but I, I see it both at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, people thinking about it, but also manufacturing coming in. So that's something that is just happening. We're, we're living through it. It's really exciting. And, you know, I think that the future of solar is definitely bright and, and we're, we're going to see great things coming in the next decade or so in terms of how that energy transition is going to happen. Yeah. And we'll be excited to see it as well. So we appreciate your time. You know, we have, you have an incredibly busy schedule and glad we were able to find time to book you on the show. And I'm eager to see the comments and questions that will be coming from the energy central community. So certainly be sure to look at those questions and keep the conversation going. But until then, uh, I just want to thank you for sharing your insight with us on today's episode of the podcast. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me here. And you can always reach Juan Pablo through the Energy Central platform where he welcomes your questions and comments. And we also want to give a shout out of thanks to the podcast sponsors that made today's episode possible. Thanks to West Monroe. West Monroe works with the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital and workforce transformations. West Monroe brings a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise to address modernizing aging infrastructure, advisory on transportation electrification, ADMS deployments, data and analytics, and cybersecurity. And once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com. And we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast.